so today I'm going to be talking about beyond static open data. So I guess, you know, what do I mean by that? Um, open data is wonderful. I feel like you all probably already know that, and I don't have to motivate that for you. Um, but I think that one of the things I want to argue about today is that uh, kind of like static data, which is maybe just data from a snapshot in time, that, that is obviously very useful. But something that I'm particularly excited about is looking at how data has changed over time. So I think, you know, from a technological standpoint, you know, companies are at the point now where they are looking at this, you know, for example, Amazon forecasts the demand of their products such that they are, you know, stocking their inventory levels well, and they're able to forecast that demand by looking at how their inventory levels change over time. Um, and I think that like for open data, we can probably do the same. And we have the technology to be able to, to kind of audit public data sources such that we can uh, track the, this data as it changes over time, um, even as like private citizens such as myself, uh, we can do this in a manner that's uh, relatively cheap. Um, and so I'm going to be talking about that process today, uh, as illustrated through a case study uh, looking at uh, some open city bike data uh, that exists. Um, so uh, just so you know, who you're talking to for like the next hour. I, I don't think this will take the full hour. I, I hope it does not take the full hour. But uh, just so you know who, who's talking to you. Um, so I am currently an AI engineer at Block, which is the company formerly known as Square. Um, so Square, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, is like the company that, uh, you know, we have these like tiny little credit card readers uh, that allow small businesses to be able to take credit card payments. Um, so I, I work there. Uh, I guess I do a lot of deep learning right now, which is maybe where the AI title comes from. Um, and then I do a fair amount of like engineering work as well to make sure that the deep learning models get uh, used uh, in an effective manner. Um, before that, I was a freelance data scientist for a bit uh, here in New York City, um, which was a exciting and very stressful job to have. Um, and then before that, I was a machine learning engineer slash data scientist. Like these, I feel like these titles are kind of fluid now uh, at, a, at a couple e-commerce startups uh, in New York. Um, and then before all that, I kind of got my technical chops by doing a, a physics PhD at Columbia. Um, and so I, yeah, so I've, I've been in the city since 2009, which is when I moved up here for grad school. Um, I, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today, I've written blog posts about um, that are on my website, uh, which you can see at the lower right. Um, and then I tend to be somewhat active on Twitter, uh, not when there's like international crises going on, but uh, you can you can find me there. And then lastly, like everything that I write about on my blog and a lot of what I'm talking about today, uh, I've, I've posted the, co uh, the code on GitHub if, if you are somehow very interested and want to go down that rabbit hole. Um, so when I was thinking about this talk, I was like thinking back to my relationship with like public data that changes over time. And I realized that like the very first data science project that I ever did back in 2014 when I was in grad school and thinking of like, I didn't even really know what data science was at the time, um, actually involved this. And so uh, back then, uh, music festivals were pretty popular. I think they're even more popular now, minus, you know, like the last two years. Uh, but back then, I, I think Bonnaroo was probably one of the most popular, like, US music festivals. And so I set up a little script while the Bonnaroo Music Festival was going on. I set up a little script to just record every tweet that mentioned the word Bonnaroo. Um, and it turned out that some fun things popped out. So one was I, I looked at how often tweets were mentioning different artists that were present at, at the festival. And in fact, you could see that you know, especially for Jack White and uh, Elton John, these peaks in when people are mentioning them in tweets corresponded to when they were uh, playing on stage. And so this was kind of like eye-opening to me that you can actually, you know, I could actually see that people were talking about people like in real time at the time when uh, they were playing. And I even had some ideas around like, you know, you could imagine like a, a terrible music analytics company that would measure your real-time engagement on Twitter in order to like, I don't know, justify record contracts or something terrible. Um, and thankfully, I, I never acted on that. Um, but uh, we're not here to talk about like music festivals. Uh, instead, I, I really want to talk about this case study around uh, around City Bike. Um, and so uh, I, you know, I think many of you are in New York. Maybe some of you are not. Uh, but um, probably many of you are familiar with City Bike. But just in case, I want to make sure that we all know the exact, you know, we're all grounded on the exact terms that I'm going to use today. Um, so this is a picture of a city bike station at McDougal and Prince. Um, I actually don't know if this station exists anymore, but I used to work by here. And so every day I would ride a bike and, and dock it at the station. Um, and so what is city bike? City bike is uh, like a pub public private partnership, but it's a, 
it's a bike share system in New York. And so the idea is that instead of me riding my own bike around the city where I have to worry about it getting stolen and rained on and things like that, I can instead pay a small amount of money to like grab a bike from one of these stations. I can then ride it to any other station and, and dock the bike there. Um, and so this is a city bike. Um, when I talk about docks, these are the docks, which is where you can put a city bike when you're done using it or where you can get a city bike from uh, when you would like to to rent one. Um, and then this whole collection of docks is what a city bike station is. Um, and nowadays, there's a whole bunch of bikes and a whole bunch of stations throughout the city. Um, I think back when, I guess when I was in grad school up at Columbia, there was no, there were no city bikes up there. They were only downtown. So I, I started riding bikes once I had moved downtown. Nowadays, uh, city bike has expanded, but it definitely has quite a bit more expansion to do if it really wants to kind of cover all of New York City. Uh, but still, there, there's over 1,500 stations and like over 24,000 bikes. And this is kind of in, continually increasing over time. And it's even over in Jersey, which is kind of fun. Um, so I mentioned that I would ride bikes to work. And so I guess this was maybe back in 2015 uh, was when I started to get interested in this because I would ride my bike to work. Um, and maybe, you know, one of the nice things about City Bike is you can look up uh, how many bikes and how many docks are at any given station at any point in time. So you can do this online or with their app. And uh, let's say I was, you know, going to ride a bike to this station that's near Washington Square Park. Um, I might look up to see how many docks are available to make sure that there's somewhere to put my bike when I get there. Um, and maybe I look up and I see that there's 10 docks available and maybe it takes me 20 minutes to get there. And I'm like, okay, great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and ride over there. Uh, this is kind of just a static view of how many bikes and docks are available at that station. Um, if I had had access to a time series in terms of the number of docks available over time, and I had seen that, you know, where this red dot is, is, you know, my point in time, maybe I'd be a bit nervous about biking to that station because, you know, very quickly, the number of docks is going to drop to zero, um, you know, or it, it, you know, looks like it is going to drop to zero. And so by the time I get there, there might not be a dock available. And so then instead, I'm going to have to go find another station, which could be a couple blocks away. I'm not a very proactive person. And so uh, I'm probably already running late. And so this is going to make me run even more late uh, getting to work. And so this was like a constant annoyance of mine. Um, and so this was around the time I was getting into data science. And so I put on my, my little data scientist hat. And I was like, this seems like a maybe a problem that, that we can solve. Um, and, you know, the first step is to, to get some data. Um, and just to you know, make it clear that it's not just me being neurotic about this problem. The, the, you know, a couple months ago, there was a New York Times article about how, you know, it's lovely that a lot of people are biking now, uh, post well during slash post pandemic. Um, but even still, uh, it's it can be difficult for for bikers to be able to find bikes and and park park their bikes in the city. And this is a hard problem um, that City Bike is still trying to solve. Uh, and so I'm not going to try to solve the problem. I would just like to be able to reroute myself um, such that I'm not wasting time. So uh, back when I was looking into this, I it turned out that there was a, a like, you know, I looked into if there was data available and it turns out that there is a public API for City Bike, uh, which is pretty awesome. Um, and so you can ping that API uh, and it will give you information about every single station in the city um, at this moment in time. Um, there's a bunch of fields, but the, the main interesting ones is that every station gets a unique ID associated with it. Um, they provide you a timestamp from when that station last reported uh, its information. And so this is like the, you know, this is in Unix epics, which is like the number of seconds since like 1970 UTC. Um, but yeah, so you get you get some sort of a timestamp. It's not the timestamp from when you are pinging the station. Instead, it is the timestamp from when the station last reported to City Bike uh, what its information was. Um, and then the good stuff is you get the number of docks that are available and the number of bikes that are available. Um, and so this is kind of the, the data that we're going to be interested in today. Um, and so back in, I guess I, yeah, I was interested in this in 2015. I started collecting data in 2016. And back then, kind of the best idea I had was uh, to spin up a server in the cloud. So um, fair warning, I, I don't know how familiar you are with AWS. If you're not familiar, uh, sorry, with Amazon Web Systems, which is like cloud computing. If you're not familiar, I'm going to try to explain some things. If you are familiar, then apologies for over explaining. Um, but my idea at the time was let me spin up an EC2 instance, which is basically like uh, spinning up a computer in the cloud. Um, and on that instance, I'm going to install a database. 
which is already kind of not great um, to have the database on the same computer that you're running your code, uh, but this is just what I did. And I set up a little cron job. So what I did was I said, all right, every two minutes, I'm going to ping the city bike API. Uh, I'm going to grab all of that information, and I'm going to write it to my database. Um, and I just kind of set it and forgot it. Um, but at the time, I, I started to run into issues. So one issue was that uh, I needed kind of like a an expensive server to run this because uh, it turned out it was a lot of data that I was collecting. So um, in that previous screenshot where I was showing the data that spit out from the API, that data as a JSON file is like almost half a megabyte. And if I'm doing this, if I'm grabbing this data every two minutes, um, this corresponds to almost like half a gig a day uh, of data that I'm collecting, uh, which is a lot of data. And so um, for all that data, I need to have like a large hard drive. Um, and you know, it, it ended up being kind of expensive and like way more expensive than I should be spending money on a silly side project, I guess. Um, and it wasn't that it was just expensive. Uh, one of the issues was that, you know, as I was storing more and more data, the hard drive would run out of space. So like every couple months, I would wake up in a cold sweat and be like, oh crap, you know, is the is my server still running? And I would log in, and you know, then I'd realize that I'm running out of hard drive space. So I'd have to like buy more hard drive space from Amazon, and then like repartition the hard drive, which is something that I have very little experience doing. Um, and so there were certain points in time where I would forget to do this. And so unfortunately, as a result, there is just like a couple month giant gap in the data uh, from when the hard drive ran out, ran out of space. Anytime I wanted to analyze the data, I would have to like dump the data from Postgres to a CSV file and download it, which could take hours. Um, and so this was it was it wasn't great, even though uh, I did run this data run this from 2016 until 2019. Um, so I think you know if the story ended here, then maybe you know my argument that we should all be uh, collecting time series data on public data sources uh, would be a bad argument because it's kind of a lot to ask somebody to have to maintain all of this and have to pay pay this money just to audit some public data sources. Um, but thankfully, uh, you know, time went on and I got a little bit better at computing and computing got a little bit better at serving people. And so uh, I ended up landing on this current setup, which is which is quite nice, actually. So um, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, this Lambda in the center, this corresponds to a Lambda function on Amazon Web Services. So Lambda function is basically, let's say I just have like a piece of code that I want to run and I want to be able to say when I want to run it and I don't care where it's running. I don't care what machine it's running on. I just want to be able to, to run it. Um, that's kind of what a Lambda function is. So your code just runs somewhere in the cloud. Um, and it one of the nice things about Lambda functions is that on Amazon, if you your first million Lambda functions that you run in a given month are free. So they have like this free tier where you know for a, a, a small amount of usage, which for my case, a million calls a month is more than enough. Um, you can just do this for free. Um, and then there's kind of this other piece here, which is called Event Bridge, which uh, basically triggers the Lambda function, which is which is another another AWS uh, system, and that's free as well. And so I can set up this little event to fire every two minutes. That event calls the Lambda function, and uh, with those two pieces, this is entirely free, um, and it just kind of works. Um, and then my data, I'm not storing the data on like a hard drive somewhere. Instead, I store my data in S3, which is kind of this cloud storage solution that is pretty cheap. So it's you know fractions of a cent per gigabyte is what it ends up costing. Um, and so for our purposes here, that's effectively free. So this entire setup runs for like less than a dollar a month, um, which I think is you know especially by New York City standards pretty cheap. Um, and so so yeah. Every two minutes, the event bridge calls my Lambda function. That function pings the city bike API, and then I write the data to, to S3, which is kind of like a cloud database or like a cloud hard drive. Um, and what's crazy is that I, ju I just set this up back in uh, September of 2019, and I just haven't touched it since. And it just keeps working, uh, which I think is rare for technology to just keep working. Uh, and so, so it's great. Um, so a little bit of details. I'm really trying to not show too much code or any other dense things at you know before 10 in the morning. Um, I my lambda function is basically just like a single Python file um, where I ping the API and then I dump my data to S3. Um, lambda functions can be a little bit painful to work with. If any of you have worked with them before, you have to like zip your files and upload them to the cloud and maybe click around. 
in like a web console. Um, and so that's kind of annoying. And so one of the nice things is uh, there's frameworks to make this easier for you. So there's a framework which is confusingly called serverless, um, where all I have to do on the right-hand side is define a tiny little YAML file um, where I provide a name for uh, like my service. Uh, I tell serverless that I'm using AWS. I tell them what type of Python I'm using. I tell them what you know what is my like little Python file that I want to run, and then you can just uh, set up kind of this cron expression, which is a way of saying, you know, how often do I want to run this Lambda function? Um, and then there's a tiny little like command line command that you run, and then they do everything for you. And just boom, like that, you now have uh, code running in the cloud. Um, this can be dangerous uh, if you don't know what you're doing. Um, you can accidentally set up Lambda functions to trigger other Lambda functions, and you can get into like infinite loops where uh, you find yourself spending a lot of money. And so you should just be a little bit careful when doing stuff. Uh, but uh, it's relatively easy. Um, I do have this code available on GitHub for the Lambda functions that run. A fair warning, uh, there's zero explanation, and it's kind of just a dump of files. And so I, I don't think it's really worth your time. But if you're really interested, then, then feel free to, to dive in there. Um, so one of the nice things, once you have your data in, like, you know, it's nice to have your data in a database, because then you can query it. It might seem like, for what I'm talking about, because I'm not using a conventional database anymore, that it might be more difficult to handle. Because my data is basically just a bunch of files that live on S3. So you can imagine just like almost like a bunch of files that are living on your computer. Um, and so then, you know, it's like, how do I how do I handle this? Do I have to write like gnarly like for loops to like look through all the different files and do stuff? But once your code is in Amazon, then one of the nice things is that they have this tool called Amazon Athena, which allows you to run SQL queries over lots of files that are living in the cloud. Um, and so I wrote this kind of simple query to try to find, you know, what is the station that has had the maximum number of bikes available ever, like across my entire data set. Um, and so I can just write, write a query. Amazon is then going to figure out how to like spin up a bunch of servers and like parallelize my query and you know query all the different files and other sorts of things. Uh, but it just kind of works, which is also great. And so I ended up, you know, I ran this query last night and I found that station ID 445 is the station that has had the most bikes available. Um, and so I decided to look up what station 445 is. It turns out it's the station at the north end of Tompkins Square Park. Um, and I really, you know, as I looked this up, I realized, oh yeah, I think I've actually been to the station. And I looked up a picture online, and you can see that it's just a beautiful, endless uh, station of bikes. Um, and so we can at least confirm that our data seems to match reality in some sense. Um, so uh, you know, back in the day, I had this cron job running on a server to collect the data. I then transitioned over to this this Lambda approach that I've talked about. Um, and only a couple months ago in December, I, I randomly tweeted about the fact that I, I happen to have just been collecting this data for uh, six years now, which is like five and a half or six years now, which is, which is kind of crazy. Um, and I tweeted that I, I happen to have this data. Is anybody interested in this? And it turned out actually like a bunch of people were interested. It's also like in the academic community, it's kind of hard to find like rich time series data sets. Um, and so uh, a couple of days later, I decided to make the data set public. Um, so I ended up uh, actually, I, as you'll see in a second, I didn't know about open data at the time. So I uploaded the data to Kaggle um, and uh, kind of tweeted about that. And then uh, this guy, Eric, who we follow each other on Twitter, never met him in person. Uh, he mentioned, hey, you know, I think open data might be interested in this. You should like submit a talk proposal. I was like, all right. Uh, and then here we are now. So that's, that, that's the story of that. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the data that's, that's available. Um, so uh, on Kaggle, if you go to this link, which you can also find this from the slides that I posted, um, there are 50 CSVs uh, that I have uploaded that contain over 360 million data points uh, across all of them. And so this is kind of all data that I've collected between August 15th, 2016, and December 8th, 2021, when I first uploaded this data. Um, each CSV only has kind of time series related to like particular stations in there. Um, the CSVs are a bit unwieldy. Uh, they're pretty big files. You know, it's like over 27 gigabytes. I think each file is maybe half a gig. Uh, and so it's, and they're CSVs, which, which are not great to work with, but I, 
I decided that CSV is at least probably the most universal data format uh, for transferring like these these things. So I would recommend like you know changing files into Parquet format or something like that if you really want to dive into it. Uh, but the data is available. Uh, it's free for me to host the data, which is great, and it's free for you to download the data and play around with it. Um, I also uploaded kind of like a very basic Jupyter notebook to show you how to kind of wrangle this data. There's a little bit of cleaning that you have to do. You know, as I mentioned, I like stopped collecting data for a couple months because things broke. Um, and so there, there's a little notebook that you can look into. And then uh, I end up plotting kind of a similar plot to what you saw before, uh, corresponding to the number of bikes at a given station uh, as a function of time. And so one of the fun things is you can kind of stare at this plot and you can learn a little something about this station. So if we look at the time, so this is back in 2019, uh, you know, back when people still commuted to work and things like that. And so if you look, so this is the number of bikes available as a function of time. You see that the, you know, around 9 a.m. or so, the number of bikes at the station skyrockets and it looks like it kind of maxes out in some sense. And then you see, you know, starting or like starting in the afternoon, but then definitely dropping by 6 p.m. You see that the number of bikes uh, has dropped down to zero or something close to zero at that station. And so one thing we can learn is that this is probably a commuting destination. So when people are arriving there in the morning, they're bringing their bikes with them. And so the station gets filled. And then at the end of the day, they end up picking up bikes and leaving. And yes, other people could be, you know, doing a reverse commute, but these people cannot counterbalance uh, like the massive rush of commuters. Uh, and so you end up seeing kind of uh, this process like this. Um, and in fact, this the station is near Madison Square Park, just a little bit west of there, like in Flatiron. And so, uh, like you know, intuitively, I think a lot more people work in Flatiron than live there. Uh, or, or probably should. Um, so uh, yes, we have this data, but uh, you know, this has been a multi-year journey. But maybe I should kind of circle back, uh, and we should think back to like, wh why was I doing this to begin with? To begin with, I was annoyed that uh, the stations would fill up uh, by the time, like before I got there. And so, you know, if you recall, I might look up the number of docks available. Uh, right when I'm, you know, leaving uh, to go to work in the morning, and if I, you know, was able to kind of like see the time series or somehow see into the future, then maybe I would know that this was not a good station to ride to, and I could save myself a little bit of time. Um, so, in the, uh, you know, data science world or like statistics world, this is called forecasting. So I, I'd like to be able to see into the future, um, and so. For that, I'm going to try to give you the world's quickest introduction to time series machine learning, um, which uh, we're going to try to have very, this is the only math equation that I will show, um, and we'll do it pictorially. But this is kind of how I, I ended up uh, wanting to solve the problem. Um, and I, I learned a bunch about time series in the process. So um, we want to predict the number of bikes that will be available uh, in the future. So at some point in time in the future, maybe it's in the next 10 minutes, maybe it's in the next hour. Uh, depends on how long your, your commute is. Um, so why is our prediction? Um, we are going to know some things at that point in time. Um, so I want to be able to use the knowledge that I have in order to make some prediction. And when I talk about wanting to make some prediction, I, I want to, you know, in math or like computing terms, I want to learn some function um, that takes in what I know and generates a prediction. So f is is some model, um, and we want to learn a model. Um, and so the the way that machine learning works is if you you know x is what you know. If I have a bunch of examples of what I want to predict, so uh, in the case of um, forecasting, I want to predict you know how many docs are going to be available, let's say in the next 10 minutes. If I have a bunch of examples of what I want to predict and what I know and I have a model, I can feed all these things together and I can train a machine learning model in order to try to generate predictions that match uh, like what I want to predict. Um, and so the goal is to be able to predict things that match what you want to predict. Uh, in practice, it's kind of like when you fit a line. Um, I have some data points. I would like to fit a line. The line is my model that I'm trying to learn. Um, so how does this work for time series? Uh, kind of the stupidest thing that you can do is you can say, all right, at this moment in time, what do I know? I know the previous values in the time series. So looking back in time, I know five minutes ago, how many docs were there, 10 minutes ago, how many docs were there, et cetera. So that's what I know. Those are going to be my x values. 
Um, and then I want to predict at some point in the future how many docs will be available. Um, and so you can kind of frame this problem as that. So just using kind of my historical knowledge of the time series, not incorporating the weather or any other variables, uh, you can try to generate predictions. Um, and so the way that machine learning works is you want to feed in lots of examples of examples of what you know, the x's, and examples of what you want to predict. Um, and if you feed in a bunch of these examples, then you can end up fitting a model to be able to generate predictions. And so how do we do this with a time series? We basically just kind of move along with the time series. And we say, all right, at this point in time, I knew this information, and I wanted to predict the next point in the time series. Now I slide up one. And I say, all right, now at this point in time, this is what I knew, and I want to predict the next value, uh, et cetera. Um, and so I ended up doing this, this was a couple years ago now, um, where I my model that I used was an XGBoost model, which is a, a tree-based model. Um, and I decided to try generating predictions from an, like looking forward an hour ahead. So like in an hour, how many bikes are going to be available at the station? And in two hours, how many bikes will be available at the station? So if you look at the black curve here, this is the like this is what I knew. So this was the actual number of bikes that were available um, at that point in time. And then the blue dots are, you know, when I only knew information from an hour before, what did I predict would be the number of bikes at that point in time? Um, and then the orange X's are when I, you know, was trying to predict two hours into the future. Um, and it turned out that things were decent. Um, I, you know, basically the blue and the orange overlay the black reasonably well. Um, Granted, this is pre-COVID, and so this was like before we had giant changes in, in the system and things like that. I think for this model, I used two weeks worth of data. So given what I knew from the last two weeks, can I predict the next uh, the next hour? Um, and it worked reasonably really well, but uh, unfortunately, I ended up just stopping there. One day, I would love to build like an app where I can input my destination and I can get some recommendations on, you know, maybe you shouldn't go to this destination, you should go to this one nearby. Um, so I think. Just to wrap things up, uh, in conclusion, open data is obviously great. Uh, you know, PDFs are better than nothing, but it's really nice to have like machine-readable open data. Kind of the next level of that are like real-time data APIs where we can, you know, get information now. Uh, but I think one of the cool things looking forward is, you know, kind of auditing those real-time APIs or just generally taking snapshots of data across time and stitching them together in a manner that we can actually like draw some insights from there and maybe even try to predict the future. Um, so in terms of the public data uh, that I mentioned, it's all on Kaggle. So you can follow this link uh, to find that and play around with it. Um, I wrote a series of blog posts about like how to do time series machine learning and kind of what I learned about in that process. So feel free to check those out. Um, and yeah, I think thank you very much for sitting through all this. And I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. I just have one question. Um, I got confused. Why did you say that um, your data was pinging a bunch of files on the server? Is that because each two minute was making its own data set? Are you asking about this setup or the previous one? I think it's this setup. I'm not sure. Yeah, so in this setup, basically every time I ping the city bike API, um, I generate a file. Right. Uh, containing all the information about all the stations at that point in time. Right. And then, yeah, I just put that file like onto S3, which is kind of like just putting it onto the hard drive. So it's, all right. so, I end up with lots and lots of files there. So then when you said the Athena parallel, you know, parallels, you're talking about like each of the two minute pings that came in was a separate file. So it was a lot of different files that they, okay. Thank yeah, you. yeah. It, in practice, Things can get a little expensive because every time you read a file, uh, it once you've kind of passed the free threshold, you pay per file that you are reading. Mm -hmm. And so there is kind of this trade-off between the number of files that you have. If you have lots of files, then you can parallelize your search, but you might have to pay for all of the different files that you're reading. Mm -hmm. And so I, I do actually, in practice, have a separate Lambda function that kind of combines files across I think all files that I wrote during that hour or that day, they all get mm -hmm. uh, um, they all get combined together to kind of like give a trade off between number of files and and cost. Okay, thank you. I'm good. Yes, I can send the link. Um, uh, I I don't think I think your microphone might be messed up or something. I, I wasn't able to understand you. Sorry. Yeah, I'm happy to respond in the chat though. That's a good question. Uh, so actually, um, 
I so let me uh, let me present again real quick. Ethan, you're on mute. There we go. Um, so I have not used this to find e-bikes, but this is definitely possible. So if you look uh, at kind of the bottom field uh, in the JSON here, you see that they do tell you the number of e-bikes that are available. Um, but uh, anecdotally, I would say that if it's hard to predict the number of bikes available or the number of docs that will be available, it's going to be even harder to predict the number of e-bikes because there's there's just not enough of them, I would argue. So, <laughs> well, I don't want to uh, I don't want to keep you all here. Uh, if you have other things to do. Oh, here we go. Ah, there are still questions. All right. Um, can City Bike incorporate these predictions into their app? I would hope so. Um, yeah, so same questions. Yeah, so I feel like at the time that I was looking into this, you know, City Bike, I remember actually looking up, they, they had some openings for some job postings for data scientists. So they, they definitely had data scientists working there, but I think a lot of what they were working on was operations research problems, like how do you rebalance the number of stations? So if I see that this station is full and I don't expect that there's going to be a lot of people needing bikes from there, then maybe I should move those bikes to another station. Um, and I almost applied for that. It would have been cool. Um, but now they're owned by Lyft, right? And like Lyft is, they have a huge data science team uh, and they have, they're a big public company. And so I, and like, obviously Lyft does all sorts of demand forecasting for uh, their cars and things like that. So I would expect that they should be able to do this. Uh, in fact, I, I think I know somebody there, so I ought to reach out um, and maybe poke them a little bit because this should be a feature in their app. So yeah, but they ought to be able to do that themselves. They have a better, they're not the ones having to like audit this data source and, and everything else. So uh, that's, that's kind of no excuse, I would argue. <laughs> yeah, I yeah to, to Luis's point, I think, you know, what I talked about here with time series machine learning, this is, uh, this is a great way to do things if you kind of have stable patterns in your data. Um, and and it's relatively quick to do if you have stable patterns. But if you are if you have like large regime shifts in your data, such as COVID, then uh, your predictions are going to be uh, pretty awful. And, and so then you probably have to resort to more statistical methods, which are probably quite a bit more difficult as well and are going to kind of narrow the group of people who are able to to generate such predictions, also to productionize such things. Awesome. Well, I I will let you all go. Uh, thank you so much for for tuning in. And uh, you know, if you have any questions, ethanrosenthal.com is my website. Feel free to go there. My email's there. Uh, feel free to reach out, and I'm always always happy to chat about this stuff. Thanks.